nasty, stinking, bitter puddle water is how coffee was once described in the 17th century. Now, this drink has been blamed for treason, immorality, even impotence, and it has caused so much controversy that it's actually been banned several times throughout history. But that's okay, because this 1887 coffee cocktail that I'm making today contains no real coffee. So thank you to Mr. Black Coffee Liqueur for sponsoring this video as I try to make a coffeeless coffee cocktail and explore the history of illegal coffee, this time on Drinking History. So this coffee cocktail is definitely a little odd seeing as it contains no coffee. Now the recipe comes from the 1887 edition of Jerry Thomas's Bartender's Guide. And he, or more likely whoever compiled it, seeing as when this edition came out, Jerry Thomas was already dead, is quite upfront in saying, the name of this drink is a misnomer, as coffee and bitters are not to be found among its ingredients, but it looks like coffee when it has been properly concocted, and hence probably its name. And so, when you want a coffee-looking cocktail, but you don't have any coffee, this is the perfect drink, because all you need is a teaspoon of powdered sugar, two ounces of port wine, one ounce of brandy, and one fresh egg. And yes, this recipe will have raw egg in it, so if you are worried about uh, salmonella, make sure that your egg is clean, not cracked, and well uh, refrigerated, at least in the U.S. Different countries have, have different rules, but in the U.S., do all those things. Give it a vigorous dry shake, meaning without the ice. That'll help get it nice and frothy. Then add the ice and give it another shake until it's well chilled. And then strain it into a glass. And then he says to grate a little nutmeg on top before serving. And that's it, the coffee cocktail of 1887. And it does kind of look like, like coffee. I mean, it doesn't look like a cocktail. Looks, looks more like coffee. Let's give it a taste. I actually really like it doesn't taste like coffee, nor is it supposed to. The egg, it gives kind of a creaminess to the, to the texture that I really like, and you get that lovely foam on top. It's the only way that you're gonna get that, which I like. The nutmeg adds just a, you get that kind of on the nose, but then once you taste it, you're really tasting the, uh, the port more than anything. You get a little bit of the burn from the brandy, but not a lot of the flavor. What's so weird, is that it tastes like there's milk in there. It's very, very creamy. Maybe it's just looking at it, but um, yeah, I like that. Now, if you do want a cocktail with a true coffee flavor, then Mr. Black, our sponsor today, is the way to go. Mr. Black is cold brew coffee liqueur made with 100% Arabica beans that they actually roast themselves. There are no artificial flavors or, or preservatives or anything like that, so all of the flavor is really coming from those beans, so they really have to, to go with the best they can find. This is not the first time that I've tasted this. I uh, tasted this. I, I actually have had this multiple times. I really, really like it. It's, it's excellent. It really does have a super coffee flavor without any of the bitterness because they add just a little bit of sugar. It's not sweet by any means, um, but, but it kind of kills that coffee bite uh, and just leaves the, the kind of mildly pleasant flavor. It's found in some of the top bars and restaurants in the world, including the London Savoy, which is where Escoffier used to work. So if you want to be like the Savoy Hotel in London and stock your bar with Mr. Black coffee liqueur, then just click the link in the description, which will take you to curiata.com and you can get a bottle delivered right to your door and use my code MAX10 to get $10 off. If Curiata doesn't ship to your state or your country, then just visit mrblack.co and you can look up where to buy Mr. Black near you. And they also have a lot about their wonderful coffee cocktails on that website. And I'm actually going to teach you how to make one of those after I talk to you a little bit about illegal coffee. So throughout history, there are multiple stories of when coffee, or usually the drinking of coffee in public, has been banned. Mecca in 1511, Cairo in 1539, and its consumption is said to have been punishable by death in Istanbul under Sultan Murad IV. The issue with most of these bans is that the details, and really the stories about them, weren't written down until years after they supposedly went into effect and then were often repealed. Also, the stories often tend to be propaganda of later ages. 
like the stories of Sultan Murad IV stalking the streets at night dressed as a commoner with a sword so that if he saw anyone drinking coffee, he could behead them on the spot. Now, could that be true? Maybe. But there isn't really any reason to think that it was, other than much later stories often told by people who didn't care for him and the Ottomans. In fact, most of the stories surrounding bans on coffee seem to be apocryphal. Like when coffee first came to Europe in the 16th century, the Catholic Church basically said that it was a drink of the devil because it was associated with Islam because that's where it was coming in from. But Pope Clement VIII enjoyed it so much that he decreed that they should baptize the coffee in order to steal it away from Satan and deliver it to Christ. Now, could that have happened? Yes, because there are some crazy stories, especially when it comes to popes. They once put a dead pope on trial and found him guilty because he didn't make much of a defense, because he was dead. But there are contemporary sources that talk about that, whereas the coffee being baptized? No. But there are several times in history when coffee was banned, or at least attempted to be banned, and they do have more evidence to support them really happening. Perhaps most famous is in 17th century England. So coffee came to England in the mid-17th century and was touted as a bit of a cure-all, seeing as it is observed that in Turkey, where this is generally drunk, that they are not troubled with the stone, gout, dropsy, or scurvy, and that their skins are exceedingly clear and white. With such a reputation, it's no wonder that coffee houses began sprouting up all over the kingdom. A place where the elite of English society could meet and discuss science, economics, politics, and do so soberly. These are the Penny Universities, which I did an entire episode on, which I will put a link in the description and have that probably pop up after this video. But it seems that the ladies of London were not such fans of the newfangled, abominable, heathenish liquor called coffee. At least that's how a 1674 pamphlet printed in London described it. A pamphlet ostensibly written on behalf of several thousands of buxom good women languishing in extremity of want. In want of what, you ask? Well, it seems that coffee has so eunuched our husbands and crippled our more kind gallants that they are become as impotent as age and as unfruitful as those deserts whence the unhappy berry is said to be brought. They come from the coffee house with nothing moist but their snotty noses, nothing stiff but their joints. That is, the men of London were no longer in the mood, and coffee was to blame. For can any woman of sense or spirit endure with patience when she approaches the nuptial bed, expecting that a man with sprightly embraces should answer the vigor of her flames? She, on the contrary, should only meet a bed full of bones, and hug a meager, useless corpse rendered as sapless as a kix, and drier than a pumice stone, by the perpetual fumes of tobacco and bewitching effects of this most pernicious coffee. So clearly, the libidinous ladies of London were laid low by the lust-lessening latte. And even worse, it made the men very, very chatty. At the coffee houses, men soon learn to excel us in talkativeness, a quality wherein our sex has ever claimed preeminence. For here, like so many frogs in a puddle, they sup muddy water and murmur insignificant notes, till half a dozen of them out babble an equal number of us at a gossiping, talking all at once in confusion, and running from point to point insensibly. They trifle away their time, and spend their money all for a little base, black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, nauseous puddle water. Strong words against coffee, though in all likelihood it was not the randy ladies of London who actually wrote the pamphlet, but one of the many satirists of the age. But regardless, it played right into the hands of the king. King Charles II did not care at all for coffee houses. But it had nothing to do with the drink's alleged effect on the male libido, but rather on the male mind. The sobering effects on the male mind. For as the women complained that men were gossiping in the coffee houses, the king worried that they were gossiping about him and musing on the many modern progressive thoughts of the time. And Charles had very good reason to be wary of these kinds of conversations because they were similar types of conversations that 30 years before led to the beheading of his father, Charles I. And so, on December 29th, 1675, Charles II issued a proclamation for the suppression of coffee houses. 
He claimed that the multitude of coffee houses springing up across England and Wales caused many tradesmen and others to misspend much of their time, which might and probably would otherwise be employed in and about their lawful callings and affairs. But far more insidious, at the meetings in the coffee houses, false, malicious, and scandalous reports are devised and spread abroad to the defamation of His Majesty's government and to the disturbance of the peace and quiet of the realm. He therefore called for a ban not on coffee itself, but on the selling of coffee in the same place where it was consumed, i.e. you could buy it, but you had to take it home to drink it. And it wasn't just coffee, but also chocolate, sherbet, or tea. The punishment was a rather steep five pound per month fine, and if the proprietor continued, he would receive the severest punishments that may by law be inflicted. The law was meant to go into effect on January 10th, but it proved so unpopular, namely amongst the king's own courtiers and ministers because they liked frequenting the coffee houses, that it never actually went into effect, and so coffee houses continued and actually proliferated throughout Britain and became one of the main places where the ideas of the Enlightenment were shared, just as Charles II had worried. Fortunately, the war on coffee is, is no longer, and the only thing that will stop me from having a cup of cold brew in the morning is if, if I run out, which, which does happen from time to time. Though even if you do run out of coffee, you can still make the coffeeless coffee cocktail of 1887, or you could also make a cocktail with Mr. Black, because many of them don't actually require any additional coffee. But the one that I'm going to make does, it requires some espresso, though you can also make it with cold brew, and that is the espresso martini. So popular, not too historic, I think it started in the 1980s, around 1983, and seeing as that's when I was born, I don't like to think of that as historic, so let's call it a modern cocktail. When you're using Mr. Black, the coffee cocktails are so much simpler than, uh, than, than without. Um, this one, it's basically two parts, or two ounces, of Mr. Black, uh, and then one part espresso, and obviously ice in there. And then give it a shake, and then strain it, preferably into a chilled, chilled glass of some sort. See, it gets all nice and frothy. Then you garnish with a few coffee beans, and that's it, espresso martini. So easy, so fast, so delicious. So whether you're going to make this or the coffeeless coffee cocktail of 1887, all the ingredients, all the liquor ingredients are available at curiata.com. Use my code MAX10 for $10 off, and I will see you next time on Drinking History.